Well, hello and welcome to the fourth instalment of my series on colour for Emma Connects. And this month I'm going to be talking about blue. Now, blue is the world's favourite colour. It's the most popular colour in pretty much every country in the world, often by a very great margin. It's become the colour of choice for major international organisations like the European Union and the United Nations. It dominates the logos of the world's largest corporations. And at any given point in time, it's believed that half of the world's population, that's about three and a half billion people, are wearing blue jeans. But it was not always thus. Blue, in fact, played a very minimal, very marginal role in human society for many centuries. So much so that blue was in fact one of the last basic colours to get a name in all human languages. After black, after white, after red, after yellow and after green. And there are many societies even today that still don't have a discrete specific word for blue. Now this raises a really fundamental question and that is why, given blue's overwhelming popularity, did humans take so long to name it? Well, I think it may have something to do with the colour's singular scarcity. Because unlike many other hues, blue rarely takes a tangible form in nature. And though we might point towards you know, a range of blue birds and fish and amphibians, most merely create an illusion of the hue by modulating their surface structures. Think, for instance, of the great morpho butterfly or a peacock. They have wonderful blue surfaces, but in fact, they don't contain a scintilla of blue pigment. The blueness is simply generated by a scattering of light. In fact, of the 64,000 vertebrate species on this planet, we have so far only found two that possess real, genuine blue pigment. And those are two species of calanimid fish. And of course, even the biggest blues in nature, even the sky, even the sea, even the horizon, they aren't actually blue. That is an illusion generated by the scattering of blue wavelengths of light by the atmosphere. And that is why if you were to plunge your hands into a blue ocean or try to bottle the blueness of the sky, you would discover they didn't have any colour at all. And for those of you who might be proud of your blue eyes, well, I hate to break it to you, your blue eyes don't contain a scintilla of blue pigment either. They too are an optical illusion generated by the scattering of light. As a result, early humans interacted with blue things very rarely. And indeed, before the invention of blue dyes and blue pigments, mostly in the Neolithic period, it was quite possible that someone could have gone through his or her entire life without ever having touched an actual blue thing, a blue object. And as long as blue was largely absent from people's lives, it didn't need to be named. So that might well be the reason. This enigmatic quality of blue, the, that, that immaterial, elusive quality of blue, I think is one of the reasons why many religions around the world associated it with their gods or their heavens. So in ancient Egypt, the ethereal god Amun was often shown with blue skin. In Hinduism, many gods had blue skin. Blue was so important to the Jewish god that he instructed Moses that all the children of Israel wore blue borders on their garments, a, a dye called techelet. And in Christianity, the Virgin Mary's robe was blue because she ultimately was the Queen of Heaven. And one of my favourite images of heaven itself is this beautiful ceiling painted by Giotto in the 1300s from the Arena Chapel. It's an extraordinary blue sky covered in golden stars. And my favourite part of it is over here where the angels are actually pulling back the blue sky itself to reveal the heavenly Jerusalem beyond. Now, over the centuries, we have simulated the colour of the heavens with all kinds of blue pigments and dyes. There is, of course, the magnificent indigo dye, which now tints our blue jeans. 
the cobalt blue of Islamic tiles and stained glass windows. And of course, the ravishing ultramarine, which came from a stone called lapis lazuli, which for many centuries was the most expensive pigment that money could buy. But new blues are being invented all of the time. In fact, just over a decade ago, in 2009, uh, two American chemists working in Oregon accidentally stumbled on a new magnesium-based blue, which they named Yinmin Blue, and many people believe it's the greatest blue to date. Though, of course, nothing can compare to the experience of staring into a bottomlessly blue sky.